Welcome to On Location Sound for Cinematic VR, presented by Sennheiser. Hi there. How are y'all doing today? Cool. Um, my name is Brian Glasscock. I work for Sennheiser Strategic Innovation, our innovation lab in San Francisco. And I'm a user experience researcher focused on immersive object uh, and those kinds of audio. So I'm really happy to be here talking to you guys about virtual reality audio. Um, before we get started, can I get a show of hands? How many people here have experience working with audio on location at, in any form, even with traditional media? OK, cool. Excellent. How many people have no experience working with audio? OK, cool. Excellent. Um, so today, like, like the slide says, we're going to be talking about on-location audio for cinematic virtual reality. And today, I want to keep it very practical and really skills-oriented. So I hope you guys can come out here with, with some knowledge about how to go out into the field and actually do this. Um, it's a little bit basic, so hopefully it's not too much for, or uh, kind of going over what some people already know. But I figured I'd start with, with the basic stuff. So before we continue, let's talk about what cinematic VR is. So cinematic virtual reality is a linear, story-based, live-action, non-interactive medium, mostly, right? <laughs> so a as we're in this field and we start to see it get developed, these terms, cinematic VR, games, they're, they're starting to be merged and be fluid, right? So for the point of this presentation, we're going to be talking about this particular definition. Uh, and the main thing here is linear, right? So we're looking at a type of virtual reality that is like more like films. It's, a, it's an experience that someone sits down and views, and it's linear and dramatic or comedic. So what are the constraints when we're thinking about audio and virtual reality and these kinds of capture scenarios? There is no off-camera. You can't have your sound guy or your location mixer with a boom standing there getting that high-quality audio. So the favorite of the location sound mixer is gone. You can't do booms. We have to figure out some other way to do it. So with that constraint in mind, what is our goal? So just as the viewer right now is immersed visually in 360 video or spherical video, we want to create that same level of experience for audio. And now how do we do that? So, so we start with capture. So on location, we have to capture audio that allows us to get the full spatial picture to create those experiences. So how do we capture spatial audio on set? And kind of, what is spatial audio? So kind of a definition of spatial audio. Spatial audio is audio that gives us more presence, right? It, it lets us know where in a room or where in a space certain audio is coming from. So if, if we were taking a spatial audio capture of this room, you would be able to tell that I'm standing in front of you if you were viewing this direction, or if you were not paying attention and looking to the back wall, that I was standing behind you. So right now, there are two solutions that people have been using for virtual reality audio on location. And these two solutions are binaural or quad binaural microphones or ambisonics microphones. And neither of these are quite new. They're, they've both been around for a long time. Um, but they're starting to see more and more use. And, and people are trying to figure out how to do this capture. So binaural microphones. This is an example of a quad binaural microphone made by a company called 3DIO. Um, quad binaural microphones and binaural microphones are easy in some ways because you capture the audio pre-rendered spatially. So there's, no, there's less work to be done in post-production to get that spatial image. And it's a single point of capture which allows us to put our microphone under a camera. And so most of the time when we're thinking about spatial audio, because we can't be in the shot, the, one of the main places that you can go with the microphone is under the camera. So this allows us to accomplish that. But binaural microphones only offer kind of certain fixed listening positions. So if you can imagine here, we have four pairs of ears on each of these, or two pairs, a uh, pair of ears on each of these four surfaces. And so we can only render listening positions where these ears intersect to make a pair. And we can switch between discrete sets of ears. So that doesn't allow the, the end listener to get a full spatial experience as they turn, because we're stuck to certain discrete points. In addition, it's very difficult to add in Foley sound effects or other audio captured on set, such as spot mics or lavaliers, because you've already rendered it into a particular set of HRTFs. 
HRTFs, for, for maybe those who don't know, are something called head-related transfer functions, which is how we take audio and process it and trick our ears into thinking that it's in space. It's, it's a set of math that allows us to, to take a measurement of a, of a per person's ears or a fake set of ears from all of these, these parts in space and get kind of the filter coefficients that allow us to do math to say, okay, if a sound's coming from here, it's affected in this way with frequency, this way with time. So you've already applied that into your sound. So adding other sounds is very hard because you, ca you can't add something to something that's already been rendered. And quad binaural and above requires support for positional panners and distribution and playback. So if you're thinking about how you're gonna distribute your content and make sure that your audience can hear it the way that you intended, if you're using quad binaural, you have to make sure your content provider supports that. Or if you're using single binaural, you're stuck to a single position. So the other option are ambisonic microphones. Now these have existed since the 70s. They were kind of a solution without a problem for a long time. Um, and so what these allow you to do, these are also single points so they can sit nicely under a camera. But these allow for fully spherical capture. So not only are you capturing single discrete points, but you're capturing kind of all of the possibilities as the user turns their head. And unlike quad binaural microphones or binaural microphones, these microphones also collect vertical information. So as the user turns their head up, or down, the world doesn't come with them, but sounds that should be at eye level when you look down stay there, which is something that's not possible with binaural microphones. And because that this is not pre-rendered into a particular set of HRTFs, it makes it much easier to add additional sounds in the post-production process. So you can take sounds that you've recorded on set with a spot mic or lavalier mic, and you can add that in your post-production process by using something called an ambisonics panner. So overall, this is a much more flexible option uh, compared to the, the kind of binaural option. But it does require more work in post-production. So you do have to have a certain set of tools that allow you to use ambisonics. And at playback, you have to use a distribution channel that supports ambisonics rendering. But the good news is, the industry is starting to go towards ambisonics and settling on ambisonics. So not only in, in capture, so in, in, in my work I speak to a lot of users, uh, a lot of people who are out in the field recording audio for virtual reality, and all of the ones that I speak to now, while they may have started using binaural microphones, everyone is moving towards ambisonics because of the additional flexibility that it allows. And with the problem that both have, that the rend at the time of playback, you have to have a renderer that supports the format you're using, either quad, binaural, or ambisonics, the good news is everyone is starting to support ambisonics. YouTube 360 is now supporting ambisonics rendering on Android and on the web browser now. Uh, Facebook 360 has released a set of tools that allow you to work with ambisonics and put things into your ambisonic sound field. And Oculus Cinema, the, the video player that's built into every Rift and Gear VR supports ambisonics rendering. So the support in the industry is there, and if you, if you were to pick one, it's looking like throughout the industry that people are moving towards ambisonics. Now with that in mind, Sennheiser over the past year and a half has been working with end users to figure out exactly what an ambisonics microphone for virtual reality should look like. We spent a lot of time out in the field talking with people, beta testing throughout in Belgium and Mexico. We even sent a mic to Iraq for, for a Doctors Without Borders piece. Our mics have been all over in this process, and I'm happy to introduce to you guys now the Ambio VR mic from Sennheiser, which is the first VR mic, the only current VR mic that's produced by a major audio company like Sennheiser. And so you, with the Ambio VR mic, you get Sennheiser's 70 years of transducer and microphone research into this new technology, or to this new form factor. Um, just a little bit of details about it. It's gonna cost around 1,500 euro. In the box, you get all kinds of accessories that you need to use it on location. And of course, you get the Sennheiser quality, durability, and our customer support that end users have come to expect from a name like Sennheiser. And the best news is, it ships in October. So 
We're starting to take pre-orders now and, and are starting to register for pre-orders now at the booth, so you should stop by and, and take a look. And that's booth A5 in the expo hall. Um, but I'm, I didn't just come here to talk about our mic as much as I would love for you guys to take a closer look at this and maybe pick one up. Um, I'm here to talk to you about how you should use an ambisonics mic on set. And so in the next section, I hope to go over kind of basic things about mounting and positioning and recorders that you need in order to make the transition from traditional location audio to working with something like ambisonics. So the main thing, one of the first things we want to talk about is placement. So wh where do you put an ambisonics mic? So we all know that it needs, at this point, that the mic needs to be outside of the field of view. It can't be in the shot. And so when, when we are doing that, it has to be, um, there are two kind of locations where that can happen. It can happen under the camera, where there's normally a blind spot that's painted out, or above the camera, where it can be easily stitched out. And now, so that, that depends on your particular shooting and your particular camera rig, so make sure to check with your director of photography or whoever's running your camera on your particular set. But we want to keep this in mind. So the mic's, the mic's location determine it, determines its perspective. So just as you, when you record video in 360, where you place the camera is where the, the viewer will see, it's the same is true with audio. So for example, if you place your mic significantly below where the camera's view is, your audio is gonna sound like it's down here and your viewer's vision is gonna be up here. It's gonna be mismatched. So try to place your ambisonics mic as close to your camera rig as possible while still, of course, staying out of the shot. Now, another thing with placement. So, when you're recording your mic with a traditional mic, say a boom, we all know the mic has a front and you, you point it towards the front. You point it towards whatever you want to pick up. An uh, ambisonics mic doesn't have a front in the traditional way of a microphone, right? It picks up sound in the full 360 spherical. So in some ways, it doesn't matter which way you, you point your microphone. But in post-production, when you're matching up your video with your audio, you want to make sure that the perspectives match each other. And so the easiest way to do that is on location, making sure the front and up of your microphone matches the front perspective and the proper up direction of your camera rig. You can correct mistakes like this in post. You can go in and make a rotation on the microphone or flip it if it's upside down. But it's easier and, mu and much better for you from a workflow perspective if you can just deliver audio and capture audio that was aligned correctly. Now, you've placed your microphone, you figured out where you want to put it, now how do you mount it? So, a, a traditional mic stand, you know, it's, it's got like a round base and a long pole. Those things don't necessarily work in these scenarios because your round base may be too big and it may actually be getting the camera shot. So, something that we've been hearing a lot from end users when we've been talking to them is they've been borrowing a tool from the, the camera world known as a magic arm. I don't know if you guys have seen these. They're made by Manfrotto and a bunch of other companies. But they allow you to position on multiple axes uh, an object. So, you can, you can take this magic arm and attach it to the, the tripod and then position your mic exactly where you want. So, it's not that traditional mic stands won't work. It's that overall we found that a more flexible option like a magic arm would be very helpful um, in these kinds of shoots. So I'm sorry, we're, we're going through a whole bunch of stuff, but I want you to get out of here with some, with at least the tools to start doing this. So continuing with mounting. Um, oh, sorry, what did I talk about here? Sorry, I skipped this slide. This was the slide I was talking about, I apologize. Um, just ambisonic mics are more susceptible to handling noise than a traditional handheld mic. So if there is any structure borne noise caused by the movement of your rig or caused by someone bumping into it or, or any, any of the things that could affect the vibration of the microphone, it's important that we, we limit that as much as possible because that noise, if, it's ca if it ruins your capture, it will bring the, the user out of that experience, out of the illusion if they hear handling noise. So make sure when using an ambisonics microphone to use a suspension mount. So we already talked about this, magic arms are important. Um, and so some of the basics of microphones don't change. Just as with a traditional microphone, wind protection is important. And make sure to use wind protection that is suitable to your, your condition. So if you're shooting inside, a small foam wind seat screen would be fine. But if you're shooting outside, make sure you have some kind of blimp or dead cat to go with it. 
Now the recorder. So this, this might be totally obvious. So out of a first order ambisonics microphone, you have four microphones in it, right? So you get four channels of audio out. So you obviously you need a recorder that can take four channels, right? Easy enough. Uh, but the Ambio VR mic also requires phantom power on all four of those channels. But this is where it gets complicated. <laughs> so the ambisonic, so if you can imagine ambisonics, right, you're capturing a sphere of sound. So the ambisonic representation of that sound in whatever space that you're capturing in requires um, or is based upon the differences between what the, what the capsules are capturing. So if a sound is louder in one capsule as opposed to another capsule, that's, that's part of how we get information about where a sound is coming from. So if the relative gains between your four capsules, say if one of your preamps is turned up, that is if one is re being recorded louder, your sound field will come out incorrect. You'll have a bad image. It'll favor one area over another. So you, you may hear something that is actually quite quiet over here, quite loud, or something that is more over here coming from, from over here. And so the only way to, to make sure that that doesn't happen is to make sure you set the gains on your recorder to exactly the same level. And now we recommend, because it's hard to do that with an analog knob, getting a recorder that allows a digital readout of gains so that you can look at the individual gains and make sure that they're exactly matched. We also recommend getting a recorder that allows you to gang together the channels. What I mean by that is after you set your gain, you may realize later on that your level needs to be louder or quieter. And if you don't have the gang together channels, that is by controlling one, you can control all of them, you will have to go in and individually adjust all of your channels and sit there and painstakingly make sure that all of your gains are set exactly the same. So if you can, make sure you get one that gangs them together. So if you do need to make an adjustment in the field, you can just simply turn one knob. And just to reinforce this, this, this process of making sure your gains are set correctly is so important that Sennheiser, with our mic, we recommend a calibration process not because the mic might be inaccurate, but because your recorder, as well as it may be, pr be produced, might have small discrepancies between its, its different preamps, or it might have a, a problem with the readout of your preamp. So we recommend that whenever you're taking a recording of ambisonics, that you use a, a tone generator. I'm sure you've seen these as a little XLR plug that goes right into your recorder. It allows you to play a certain tone at a certain amplitude. We, we recommend that you record on each channel that you'll be recording ambisonics on a tone of equal level. So later on in post, if you realize, oh, well, I set all of the gains correctly, but it turns out my recorder is just broken or, or there's something that's off about it, and you realize that your sound field is not imaged correctly, you can go back and use these tones to set the relative levels. So you have the information you need in order to make a correction if it's necessary. Now, we've talked a lot about kind of how to use ambisonics, but I also want to talk about what ambisonics isn't good for. This isn't your end-all, be-all microphone. It is great to, to do certain things, but it is not good for providing uh, the audio of specific sounds in loud or reverberant environments. So if you're, if you're picking up dialogue and you need it to be super clean or you want to pick up the noise of some particular object or person, you're going to want to spot mic that. Lavalier mics are still your, one of your best friends in the virtual reality game. So you still want to make sure that the, the audio capture techniques that do work, such as lavaliers, are still being used. So in the case that you're using both lavaliers and ambisonics, what that allows you to do is it allows you to get a spatial sound bed to provide context for your, your, your spot capture. But then it allows you to take spot microphones and place it into that. So you can have clear audio, but with the spatial context of ambisonics. And now we're not really going to post-production, but I am mentioning post-production a couple of times here just so you have some context about why we're making certain choices. Um, I think, actually, overall, that's most of the information I want to talk about <laughs> um, because I wanted to open up for questions. I, I know I talked about a lot of different things, and I know that there maybe went through things sort of fast, or people have specific questions that they want to learn about. So I figured I'd open the floor up to whatever questions people may have they have about uh, VR audio or recording audio on location.
So I think they have a microphone in the back. Yeah, you ended with the most interesting part. So you want to use a lavalier mic. Do you have any solutions for tracking the XYZ position? So when I go into post, I'm able to properly position the audio? Yeah, so that's, that's one of the biggest pain points that exists right now in capturing audio for, for VR. There's not an excellent solution at this point for, for doing the tracking. Some people have done face tracking um, using After Effects and taking those vectors into something like uh, Unity or Unreal. Um, but there are, there's no existing off-the-shelf solution that allows you to just put a tag on somebody and track them around and bring that into your, your post-production. So that, that's, that's something that is a problem. Um, and uh, I don't know if anyone else knows any good solutions to that, but there's none that exists to, to my knowledge at this time. <coughs> yeah. I mean, uh, in post-production, what it looks like right now is people are sitting there with automation curves, drawing very painful automation curves over time. So you have a lavalier. If this person's walking around, you sit there in your Pro Tools session or in your Reaper session and draw both an azimuth and an elevation change over time for that particular person. But I don't know any quick way of automating that at this time, so. Okay. Next question? Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, what recorders do you recommend using? So, um, I can tell you what our, I, I don't, Sennheiser doesn't recommend any particular recorder, uh, but I can tell you what our users are using. Um, a lot of people are using the Zoom F8, uh, kind of on the cheaper end of things. Uh, we get reports that it has pretty good, uh, pretty good preamps and that it allows for the ganging and also the digital readout of the gain, so the two essential features. Um, also, sound devices. Uh, I'm going to forget this number off the top of my head, but I think it's the 788T um, provides all the features we need. Um, and the people also use the DR680 Mark II from Tascam. Any other questions? Yeah, question here. Uh, the last thing you mentioned was combining um, the MBO mic or Ambisonics mics with lavalier or other microphones. How do you handle the case where the Ambisonics microphone picks up, for instance, the dialogue that you're trying to capture with the, um, with the uh, uh, dialogue mics? Mm -hmm. um, is that a, a post-production topic, or where do you address that? Yeah, so we've actually had some, we, we have users that come to us and talk to us about that. And a lot of what we hear is that it can be complementary, that it can be used as kind of a natural reverb, that it applies some presence to that voice. Um, so. If, if people don't want that capture or they're getting phase issues from having the ambisonics mic and the lavalier, some people will cancel that out in post-production or to try to remove that sound in post-production. Um, but a lot of the time, we actually hear people using those two things combined together to provide some presence and room to the lavalier that's a kind of cold cut capture. So. Um, have you ever seen an application or is there a workflow for an application of doing impulse responses with an ambisonics mic? Yeah, I, pe people do. I mean, the ambisonics mics have a whole variety of uses besides just capturing audio. Taking impulse responses is one of them. Uh, I can't speak to any particular use case that I've heard of with that. Hey. Um, camera side here, so you're going to get kind of a camera-driven question. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the the microphone itself goes, I'm assuming it. I haven't looked at it yet, so I'm assuming it looks like a, you probably have one. <laughs> yeah. So my question is, is just in terms of a lot of these VR camera rigs and whatnot, they're all, like, it's all very much a work in progress. Does the guts, the top part, like, if you wanted the microphone mounted to the top, but the top wouldn't have space for the whole microphone, would you be able to break away the bottom, maybe put that on the, at the bottom of the rig, and then just put the microphone on the top of the rig? You see what I'm saying? Because yeah, I see. All, the, all that really matters is where the microphone is, but you could put those guts anywhere. Yeah, well, I mean, the way that the microphone is constructed doesn't allow that. I mean, th theoretically, what you're saying is correct. Like, the, the important part of the microphone is here. Yeah. Um, but this, this section here includes the balancing. So out of the mic, you get fully balanced uh, audio signal, so it's not going to be re I, receptive to interference? Right. No, no, no. I know that can't go away. Yeah. Um, I just meant in terms of being more dynamic as far as how the mic gets mounted to a camera. 
is it, it's, but it sounds like you've answered my question. It's not possible to break these, the amplifiers separate from the microphone. So you can put the microphone here in the amplifier or wherever as long as it's not in frame. Yeah, that's there true. No well, problem. at this point, no, but that's a great idea. So, okay. no, thank you. <laughs> Um, currently, how often do people record synchronous sound versus non-synchronous sound in cinematic VR experiences? You mean with time code or without time code? Or? Um, like, I guess ADR versus like on set. I'm sorry, you have to tell me what ADR is. Uh, like recorded afterwards. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Or simultaneously. Yeah, so uh, I, a lot of people are adding kind of Foley or other sound effects that are added afterwards. Um, and you can, you can spatialize that in the same post-production processes that you can spatialize kind of the lavaliers that you record on set. Does that answer your question? So I mean, p people are doing both, right? So, so a lot of people are, are capturing things on location using an ambisonics mic to get the presence of being in that particular space. But just as in, in traditional film, um, people don't actually always want the exact way that a certain thing would sound or look. They, they want it to be dramatized. And in those scenarios, a lot of people are doing re recording after the fact and integrating that into their mixes. Another question over here. Yeah. Um, do you guys have a proprietary um, converting or conversion software that comes with the mic? So with Ambisonics, any kind of these Ambisonics microphones, you get out what's called Ambisonics A format. Um, and the conversion process from A to B format is something that, that has been published since the 70s. It's not proprietary. It's simple addition of single, addition and subtraction of signals. Um, what we do provide with the microphone that is proprietary is a filter that, that helps that process sound better. So each, each microphone will have its own filter that's designed to improve the sound quality through the A to B conversion. Uh, what's your experience uh, recording music with this, especially with a key instructor that has to be matched all around, and instruments having different, you know, sound pressure levels? So if they have different sound pressure levels, you're going to capture that in the in the in your audio, right? So it's going to capture kind of whatever you hear. So if one instrument happens to be quieter than another instrument, that won't be fixable necessarily. Um, so a lot of times in music scenarios, what we recommend is using ambisonics to provide a sound bed. And I would mic those instruments individually to give you more artistic freedom over control of those individual instruments. Because if, if you're just using ambisonics for that audio, you're, you're going to be stuck to what, whatever it sounds like in that room, which for music may or may not be the best. We've done some tests of this with symphony and, and those, those environments, and it's actually turned out really well. So the mic's audio quality is good. Um, but if it's like a rock band or on stage or something like that, having individual control over channels might be really beneficial. Hi, I like to tilt my camera a lot. So obviously there is a pivot difference from the, ca from the camera pivot and the mic pivot. Is that something you think is perceivable? I would say it depends on how close the sound source is right. and how much the tilt is, right? Right. So if the sound source is 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 very close, I think you're gonna get that angle difference more. So we'll, we'll, we'll have to live with it for a while, I guess. No, I mean, I think what you could do is attach the microphone to the camera in such a way that when the microphone, when the camera tilts, the microphone tilts at the same degree. Ah, okay. And, and then, so if you attach it with a, the magic arm or some other type of clip, what you're doing is you're attaching it straight onto the monopod or ho however you mount your camera. Got, yeah. Uh, got it, but... <laughs> The mic is going backwards. If I tilt my camera like this, if it's, or forward, if it's on top of the camera, mm -hmm. there is a slight difference in the position. You know what I mean? Well, as long as you, for example, say this is your camera rig, right? Right. And this is your microphone. If, as long as they stay on axis while it's turning, right. you're going to achieve the same, same kind of perspective with audio as with video. So the important thing here is just making sure that when those things move, that they stay together. Sure. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, my question is a little bit more on the engineering side. Uh, I've been waiting for an uh, ambisonic microphone that's highly miniaturized. Do you guys have any plans in the future to get something like that? 
there's nothing to comment on at this time. I mean, the reason why we have this geometry uh, is that you know cardioid capsules require a certain distance behind them, um, and so this is the closest we could get with the capsules that we have to provide the sound quality that our users desired. For this particular mic, I don't want to go too much into that necessarily, but for this particular microphone, it has the geometry it has because of the constraints of the capsules, yeah. Cool. Any other questions? Oh. Hi. Um, so I wanted to ask you about uh, your recorder placement, if you have any uh, experience or with that, that, uh, you know, the whole problem of you have to start the camera and everybody leaves the room, mm -hmm. but for a sound person, that's really, you know, a problem because you can't check the levels, you even to check to make sure the take you just got isn't completely blown out. Mm -hmm. So uh, I guess, are you, are you mounting it on a monopod next to it so that, and then just going and popping out a card and going in and checking on your laptop? Or I don't know, do you have any workflow that you've done with that? Yeah, so monitoring, just like the automation of sounds of, of spatialization is another major pain point in this process right now. So at the moment, it's very hard to monitor in binaural or in ambisonics in the field, right? Because that process requires converting it to B format and then taking B format and rendering it binaurally. So there's not a, a simple solution there besides popping out the card, plugging it into your laptop and going through that process. That is for checking a take, right? Um, now, for a recorder position, we've seen end users do a variety of things. So uh, some of our end users, keep the recorder underneath the camera because it's convenient and it's out of shot. Um, the, again, the problems with that are you can't monitor levels while the shot is going on. You, have, you don't know if you're peaking during the shot. You don't, I mean, all of the pitfalls of not monitoring your levels or even your audio, right? Um, some, what some people will do to overcome that is they'll run a cable um, out to a hidden location and they'll ask the, the video people to take a plate and then to stitch out the cable. By plate, I mean take a still image of something. I don't know how easy that is. I'm not a video person, but I know that's something that, that some people have been doing. But I think uh, monitoring is, is definitely somewhere that, that is a big pain point, so. Uh, my question is about sensitivity of the microphone. Uh, essentially, if we're going to be rigging it to a camera and then leaving the room, how sensitive is this microphone and what is the difference between using uh, this microphone as a primary recording source or is it essentially just an elaborate you know, uh, onboard microphone just to record the, your bass tracks? I mean, I think that question, I don't know the exact sensitivity numbers off the top of my head, but I, I think the answer to that question is it depends on the environment that you're in, right? If, if, if it's a, a semi-dead space or a treated space and you're recording using the ambisonics mic, you can, you can capture things uh, as that with your, sorry, you can capture an, using an ambisonic mic as your primary microphone. So if you go to our booth, there's some demos of content that was recorded only using the microphone, to, if, if that would give you a better sense of what it would sound like. Um, but on those demos, we were able to record a piano in a reverberant church, and we were also able to record a person's voice standing a couple meters away from the microphone. So, so it, the microphone is flexible, but just like any microphone, it's dependent on the environment you're in, the noise of the environment, and the rever reverberation of that environment. Right, um, over here again. The, a number of the cameras now have, have redundant downward pointing lenses or sensors so that you can stitch out the, the, uh, the rig, the, mm -hmm. um, the stand. Um, the closer you bring the mic to the camera, the more you're blocking the lens's field of view. Mm -hmm. Is it mathematically possible to build the ambisonic mic into the camera itself so placement isn't an issue, or doesn't that work out? Ozo currently has eight microphones and eight sensors, mm -hmm. we, but I don't think that's ambisonic. No, that doesn't operate on the ambisonics principle. I mean, ambisonics itself uh, relies on an idea of coincidence. Right, so, so, so ambisonics recording, in a perfect world, all of these microphones would be in the same location just facing different directions. Of course, there's, that's not possible with the constraints of capsules and physics and the ability of things to exist in the same space. Um, so <laughs> put, putting it in a camera, it depends, right? I mean, it depends on what the camera looks like, what shape and where it would be. So I don't really have an easy answer for you on that. So something like the Ozo uses a different uh, audio technique than, than Ambisonics. 
So circling back to the monitoring, isn't it possible to make it wireless then, each of the outputs? Yeah, so you could put the, the outputs of your recorder, say uh, a stereo mix of it or individual channels um, over a wireless system. The problem with that though, you, it's, it's good because you can check to see if the individual capsules are clipping, which is a good goal. Because then you know at least you've captured something that is not, you're not gonna throw away. But you still don't get the, the binaurally rendered audio that gives you the spatial picture. So that gets you half the way. So, so it, it gets you to the position of making sure that your audio is captured correctly, but it doesn't get you to the point of knowing kind of what your soundscape sounds like. So. Anything else? It's kind of related to what this other fellow was talking about with the, you know, the Ozo has the microphones built in with the cameras. And the, the problem with this is, what I see is that, you know, you probably want the mic attached to the camera so when it's moved, you know, it tracks the camera. But, you know, the, the problem is maybe the, uh, the camera might pick up the mic, but also the camera might block sound from the mic. So w would you have to uh, maybe adjust your channels? You know, in the direction where the camera is, maybe the sound is gonna be different because it's a physical thing that's kind of like blocking that. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So, so that's one of the other considerations to do in placing the mic is understanding the kind of a rough idea of the reflections and, and occlusion that would take place from the camera. So we recommend getting as close as possible. But the reason why I didn't mention that is usually you can't get it close enough that you'll have that issue because most cameras require you to be a little bit below that area. So it is true that the camera can cause occlusion uh, and reflections that would be bad for the audio capture. But usually when you're looking at uh, a VR shoot, the, the microphone has to be down a certain distance to be out of the shot, that that is not something actually to take into consideration. With the Ozo, for example, um, we've had end users who are using the Ozo as their, as their primary camera want this because they think that the audio quality of this type of capture is, of, of, is superior to something like the Ozo's integrated system. Yeah, um, hey, oh, sorry, it's really loud. Um, are you guys working with anybody on the post side to kind of like have any partners of, like, because I talked to Adobe Atmos guys, they have a, product that they're working on that's not out yet, but um, it seems like post is the real pain point here. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious, like what, if anything, you guys are having the works on that side. So we're a, we're a microphone company. Um, uh, we're not providing any post tools. Uh, we do provide one tool with the microphone that allows you to go from Ambisonic's A format to B format, which is what all of the post-production tools for virtual reality audio accept. Um, so we're, we're providing that essential step in the post-production process, um, and we hope to to be open and and be able to give audio to kind of whatever post-production process that that people are looking to use. So we we hoped that that's the nice thing about Ambisonics. If you're catch, capturing in Ambisonics, these post-production processes all support Ambisonics, um, and it's not a proprietary format. It's not a codec. You don't have to buy special software. There are free options available to work with it. Um, so that's one of the things that we enjoy about Ambisonics is that it's an open format that you can kind of give to anybody and all of the post-production software takes it. The mic is uh, 1,500 euro, which comes about 1,650 US dollars. That's, the pricing is not finalized yet, but that's around what we think it would be. Uh, I'm sorry, and again, coming from a camera guy here, so this is probably a stupid question, but returning back to the whole wireless, why can't this work again with four wireless transmitters and four wireless receivers at your, back at your? Sure, so Ambisonics is a format, so it's four channels, but you shouldn't think of it as four channels that can be played back on a speaker system. Right. So, so Ambisonics is four channels that c captures the sound field data that allows you to have a spatial representation of it. So in order to make, have it make sense over headphones, you have to decode that using what's called a binaural decoder into, into this kind of stereo 
uh, image process. But understand that. Okay, so maybe maybe monitor is the, the wrong word. So when you're saying monitor, you don't mean in terms of just setting levels. You mean monitor in terms of actually physically listening to it. Yeah. Okay. So, 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 so setting levels, doing the wireless thing would totally be fine. You can, you can tell if a capsule is clipping. You can, you can make sure that you're not too hot or you're not too quiet. But you, won't, you can get a rough estimate of that because the ambisonics decoding process changes that a little bit. Um, but for, the, for, the simple, uh, for simply setting levels, that, that might be an acceptable solution. Okay, yeah. that, that's, that's, that's what I was, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Cool, well thank you guys very much. Um, hopefully that was informative. Uh, if you guys have any more questions or have any trouble kind of, oops, any trouble kind of working this out, feel free to send us an email at vrmike at sennheiser.com. <laughs>